This week on Dialogue, the International Reporting Project, Dateline Liberia. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. I'm John Molesky. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. This week's guests participated in an intensive fact-finding visit to Liberia under the auspices of the International Reporting Project's Gatekeepers Editors Fellowship Program. Before introducing you to our guests and learning about their work, we'll hear from John Shidlovsky. John is director of the International Reporting Project, founding director, and I had the opportunity to speak with him earlier today. John, tell us, what is the mission of the International Reporting Project? We created this program now 14 years ago to encourage the U.S. media to do a better job and to do more international reporting at a time when much of the mainstream media was cutting back on their international coverage. So our mission is to report, to encourage U.S. journalists to go to all countries in the world to report particularly on undercovered or neglected important international stories. Have the budget cuts, cuts we've seen in the industry uh, created more people applying for your fellowships? Absolutely. We are swamped with applications. We have uh, journalists from all news organizations in the United States that you can think of and lots of freelance journalists who might have been working for those organizations in the years ago applying for our grants. So we're, we've become one of the most competitive programs in, in the country. And tell us about the Gatekeeper uh, Editors trips. The Gatekeeper Editors, we started that about 10 years ago be, uh, after we had already been giving grants to individual reporters to do intensive five-week reporting trips. But then we realized a few years after doing that that we needed to find a mechanism to encourage editors people who really made the day-to-day -day decisions about what gets on the air or in print or online to get them a chance to get out of the newsrooms and to get excited again and to get motivated and to understand why international coverage is important. So we began, uh, now we do two trips a year, very intensive, almost uh, like expedition, two-week intensive immersion trips to one country uh, with about 12 editors uh, from all types of media from all around the country. And we're going to meet three of them today, later. That's right. And uh, Liberia. And tell us about this trip, specifically this trip. We've been very strong on Africa from the beginning. Six of our 14 gatekeeper trips have been to the African continent. Uh, nearly one-third of our individual fellows have gone to Africa for reporting because we feel that Africa is particularly neglected in the U.S. media. Why Liberia? Well, the war ended seven, eight years ago now, but a country do doesn't just drop off the map. Uh, it continues to exist. People have dreams. People are developing. The, the, the main message we were trying to uh, get our editors to look at was how does a country recover from one of the most brutal series of civil wars that took 14 years out of Liber Liberia's history. And we went there to look to see how Liberia is beginning to rebuild itself in all institutions uh, at a time when the, much of the media began to forget about Liberia because the wars had ended. And the person behind this trip the, the, who did all the planning, I know you wanted to mention her. I have to give credit to Louise Leaf, the deputy director of the International Reporting Project, who did a fabulous job putting together an amazing program uh, during our two weeks there. We met President uh, Sirleaf and we met uh, dozens or hundreds of people in Monrovia, upcountry. We got out to rural areas and it's very difficult to get there because of the infrastructure. And uh, we met a wide cross-section of Liberians to really give the editors a better understanding of what's happening there, it's particularly this year with the presidential election coming up in the country, uh, they will now be better uh, uh, able to cope with covering that, that election and understanding the issues in Liberia in the future. Great. Thank you, John. Thank you. Suni Khalid is managing news editor for WYPR in Baltimore, Maryland. Previously, he's worked for Time, The Washington Times, USA Today, Voice of America, and NPR. Ed Robbins is an independent, multi-award winning director, writer, producer, and videographer. Outlets for his work have included PBS, the Discovery Channel, National Geographic Channel, ABC, and the BBC. And Teresa Wilts is a senior editor for TheRoot.com, where she helps oversee production of the African American web magazine. 
She previously served as a staff writer for the Washington Post style section. I want to welcome all of you to Dialogue. Thanks for joining us. Now, let me be begin before we delve into some of the details of your experience of asking you how you got involved in the International Reporting Project. Teresa, if we begin with you. A friend of mine who was a former, Recommended you? Recommended. She, actually, two friends had recommended. Um, one who's a former fellow with the project and Kai Wright, who's um, one of our writers at TheRoot.com, and um, Rachel Swarns, a good friend of mine from the New York Times who had encountered them along the way when she was in South Africa, so covering for the Times there. So, you know, Liberia, I have a friend who's there who's been trying to get me to go, and I was very curious. So you had no previous experience reporting from Liberia. This was a crash course for you. This was a crash course. I'd reported from Ethiopia and Senegal, but yeah, this mm -hmm. was my, you know, English-speaking West Afri Africa. This was my first time. Ed, how did you get involved? Um, actually, um, similar story. Uh, Anne Derry, who's head of the um, Internet Video Division at New York Times, where I've done work with, um, she recommended me. She had gone on the China trip and had an amazing time and. Uh, recommended me as uh, they take one videogra um, video uh, video journalist and um, so spoke to the people it was great and similar your first time in the country my first time in Liberia I've been uh, I've done uh, I did a film in Nigeria and I did um, some pieces out of uh, the border uh, in South Sudan mm -hmm. and that's it for for uh, Africa really for me so I was very anxious to uh, expand it into uh, Liberia. Sunni, what about you? Uh, Gifty Nadi, who was a student at SICE, told me about it. And Nicole Killian, who had gone to South Africa uh, with the IRP, they told me about it. I had been, uh, I guess I've been in about 35 African countries um, and spent a lot of time in Sierra Leone and Senegal, but I'd never been to Liberia. And, you know, I said, you know, this is, this is good. Seems like a lot to report there. And I found much more than I had previously thought I was going to find. G give us an example of that. What, what are some of the things that you found most surprising when you hit the ground? Um, well, one of the things, you know, I had, there was a movie that I like called Lord of War with Nicolas Cage, and it's supposedly set in Liberia, uh, although it was filmed in South Africa. And the images, you know, general butt naked and, you know, child soldiers and, you know, just mass destruction. and. Uh, when I first went there, I said, well, uh, essentially what we'll be doing is we'll be, you know, writing or finishing writing Liberia's obituary mm -hmm. because I had seen the clips of seven years ago and eight years ago. I was actually stunned to see Monrovia uh, had recovered as much as it, it had uh, to see the, the pace there and to see people there. But land disputes was one thing that I had never even thought of before. Uh, Louise Leaf. Uh, did an excellent job producing because that's essentially what she did. She put us in position. She basically it was like t-ball. You know, she put the ball she books up on the, the entire tee, trip. You step in, and and you step in, and you swing. And uh, that and uh, sexual and gender-based violence was another uh, you know matter that isn't reported enough on here. And you know, I sort of got steeped in it, and um, you know, did some reporting on it. Uh, Ed and Teresa, similar thoughts. So, what, the things that you found most surprising, I'm sure, even though you'd not been to Liberia, you'd been to other countries, you had expectations, you had some ideas of what you might encounter. Um, I, I think, um, similar to, to Sunni, but he's much more of an Africa hand than I am. Uh, I came with intense images filling my head of, you know, 13-year-olds um, with guns uh, on the streets and, um, uh, that the issues I'd be dealing with would be a lot of ex-combatant issues and um, a lot of tension on the street, a lot of overt kind of, uh, you know, we're the foreigners and, you know, a, a, a kind of a very tense post-war atmosphere. And so for me it was an adjustment to, oh, right, they are here and, and we're still a bit here in the news cycle. We're still thinking about the kind of news that came to us that's filling our heads and Let's find out what they have to say. And to part us. of that is because Africa is underreported. So, Absolutely. you know, and and the and the predominant so we're catching narrative. Up? Right, we're catching up. The predominant narrative is war and destruction, rape, mm -hmm. missing limbs, child soldiers, when the reality is much more complicated than that. What, uh, you wrote a, a fascinating piece about the sort of ties <laughs> to America's uh, past. Uh, right. And tell us about the origins of the capital city's name. Um, it was named after James Monroe. Um, 
then President of the United States. I mean, Liberia was ostensibly founded by freed slaves um, coming from the states, most, a lot of them from Virginia and Maryland, um, many of them mixed race, children of slave owners, who white slave owners who would prefer to just have that evidence shipped across the ocean. Sure. Um, and so, but what I found fascinating is that power corrupts. So these people that were horribly oppressed in the states, um, once they got a little taste of power, they instituted basically kind of a Jim Crow situation right there in Liberia. And I just found, I was expecting to feel much more this American vibe. And it's mm -hmm. there, but it's a lot more subtle. I mean, it's, it's a West African country. I mean, that is their identity. Um, that's how they see themselves. Um, and to be America Liberian is not such a good thing. So, but one thing I wanted to say is sure. my the thing that surprised me the most about Liberia, Monrovia, was how much it reminded me of Afghanistan. I, I was in Afghanistan shortly after the fall of the Taliban and Taliban, and some of the same elements, that same atmosphere of like kind of being in this bombed out city. So you're not talking about the culture, you're talking about just where the country is in its history. Where the country is in its history, they're struggling with some of the same issues of corruption, um, kind of this lack of a centralized, real centralized government. So, you know, very, a lot of ethnic divisions and, and rivalries, trying to find some kind of cohesive unity, and then the situation with the women. So, um, and that, you wouldn't expect that. I mean, Central Asia and West Africa are obviously worlds and worlds apart, but, but it, it reminded me a lot of that. That was my biggest surprise. And, and we're talking about fragile states that are yes. trying to, the center to hold and, exactly. and something better to spread out from there. How, when you, uh, what's your take on the country's state of fragility? Uh, do you think that <clears throat> they're on the right path and it's a positive scenario? Well, that was the whole thing that I got because I've been to enough countries where you see the indicators going down. Uh, countries with governments which are much stronger uh, that are much more established in Liberia and, and that optimism uh, we met we went to uh, the University of Liberia and we met some of the students and they were just you know they energized me just being there but there is a sense of optimism I think maybe some that spread because they've been through essentially 30 years of political turmoil they had two civil wars within a 20-year span and they survived all of that and you know it's all gravy um, and the, the other thing that I liked at least talking to uh, the president Ellen Johnson Sirleaf we were able to see her right before we got on is that all three of you got to see the, uh, the, the whole group, the whole group. The whole group. Yeah. and I had met her a couple of times here before but uh, you see a sort of a clear-eyed leadership these are the problems we're not going to try to avoid them that they're, they're yeah. you know they're overwhelming but you know, we are going to try to do this. And, you know, after, you know, being based in Cairo for three years and, and being around there, you see a government which doesn't want to acknowledge or do anything about any of the problems. They want the problems to, to fester or, or just go away and ignore them. And there was a sense of uh, optimism there that I thought was misplaced. And when I got back to the States and I talked to people who had been there and they said, no, your, your optimism is not misplaced at all. This is what we feel. And after being in, in some of the places that all three of us has been, it was almost, um, we're almost taken aback. It was yeah. disconcerting to say, wait a minute, there's actually a place where they're looking forward to the future. I'm assuming no, both I, of you agree with the, uh, the, yes. uh, well, I actually, the characterization of the leadership and that, that the president's providing. The president is, is very impressive. I mean, looking uh, actually back at the, uh, the film of the uh, president's interview, she is, um, you know, articulate on top of the, um, she's so sharp, she's so smart, and she's so on top of every issue that came up. She didn't go through it in a vague way. She had specifics behind every yeah. answer. She was clear, she was sharp, and... She didn't um, have to consult her notes. The she Iron was, Lady, was, they call her. Like, and you, and she, I, think, I think, Teresa, you wrote yeah. that she yeah. is uh, open and direct without being warm. That she, it's an interesting, uh, the way you described her, that she sounds like a... She's kind of no-nonsense. No-nonsense. I mean, friendly, but not, you know... I wanted to follow funny. up on something Teresa brought up. Um, you know, because she was in Afghanistan right after, um, uh, after the uh, invasion, 
and and I um, I was there a similar time, and then I kept going for a number of years. And in hearing her talk, what it makes me think of is how um, what what is so different for me, and and maybe why it's, you know. I saw that hope that was so strong yes. when I came there the first yes. year I was there yes. over the course of th whatever, four years, you know, I kept going back quite a bit. I saw it evaporate. And so to go to Liberia yeah. six, you know, six -ish years later and to see that it was actually, you know, there were so many problems, but that part of it was, was there and that gave me hope. And then to meet the president and to see that, you know, she's a strong hand leading it, and she sent the whole ministers, we all of her yeah. ministers. Time out. Uh, like, <laughs> Go you to your know, corner. Yeah, like, to your corner. <laughs> 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 Sit in the corner, you know, we'll see who's fired and not, but let me think about it. Uh, there's some other As, world leaders who wish they could do the same way. Oh, my yeah. God, that's, an, uh, that's a strong move. Be before and we leave on a trip to the United and States. And it just goes. Hey, doesn't care about I'll the political fallout. I'll be back, fallout. check it later. <laughs> and there really wasn't any political fallout. Mm -mm. Right. You know? I mean, Let's, people uh, were we like, have a clip of, uh, we'll take a look at, share with our, our viewers and listeners uh, here directly from the president. This is something that uh, Ed shot and edited. And so we'll take a look at this piece right now and then we, you can speak a little more about her. It's a societal problem. It's not a government problem. It's systemic. It comes from the many years of deprivation when people did not did not have a living wage, when people were told they could just survive on their wits, and that's exactly what they did. To survive, it was through extortion, dishonesty, indiscipline. It became, and still is, a cultural problem. Now, we need everybody to be on board to address this. In the public service, you have cases of bribery, fraud, through procurement practices, mismanagement of resources. Go beyond that. It takes place in the media, in the churches, even in the foreign missions where they have staff, because it's been part of that culture. We have to address it in a comprehensive way. Most times people talk about it and just say, why aren't you jailing people? Why aren't you taking people and throwing them in jail? Yes, we have to do that. And our judicial system has not reached the level where we can move these cases fast. But you've got to address it in more than that. You've got to address it through compensation to reduce people's vulnerabilities. That's what we've done. Increasing public servants pay from 15 US dollars a month to a minimum today, $80 a month. You've got to address it through the billing of institutions. And that's what we've done through the General Auditing Commission, the Anti-Corruption Commission, the internal auditing functions. You've got to do it through policies. So we've now put laws in, public management financial laws that we've now done. You've got to put in systems because everything was done by discretion, written, no automation. We're just trying to automate the system. You've got to do it through capacity building and then punishment. Unless you attack it in this comprehensive manner, you will only find yourself coming right back to it. It's still a problem for us. And we accept the criticism that more needs to be done. But it's not going to be done by just standing up and making noises and criticizing. Unless we all see it as a societal problem and we all work on it, any government will just pass it on to the next government. Okay, now how is that message resonating with the populace? Where, uh, the president's heading into an election. I, <laughs> they, uh, they're impatient, the ones that we've talked about, because corruption was the one thing. Corruption yeah. and roads were the two things you heard yeah. about the most. And it's bad to rape. And, and the roads are, yes. uh, you go outside the capital city and the roads are a mess, is that correct? There's like one road. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sort of two, one and a half ratted. kind of. Well, they, well, the, but, the Chinese are the Chinese are repaving a lot of the streets downtown, and yeah. and the president was saying that they want to have roads that link uh, the the other 15 counties, the county seats, all the way through. But you know that's going to take a long time and a lot of money to come up. And with that's part of roads. the problem. I mean, the roads are significant because they're impassable unless you have you know a Range Rover. Um, 
and for like farmers. So this, you know, Liberia is this incredibly lush country with you know, the potential for to be an agricultural powerhouse, but farmers can't get their wares to the market, so the crops rot. Crops rot, things don't move, <clears throat> uh, people can't get to work. If there is work, they can't get to it unless it's within walking distance or, I mean, there are, you know, The rainy tracks, season just makes it yeah. worse. Yeah. And, and just to provide some context for a U.S. Uh, US audience, we're talking about an unemployment rate of 85 percent? But that's so. deceptive yeah. because, I mean, yes, it, there's 85 percent unemployment and that means sector. that people don't have formal jobs, but everyone there works. I mean, even on a Sunday morning, I took a walk um, one morning out in Bong County in the country and seven o'clock on a Sunday morning, it was filled with people, you know, getting ready to sell flip-flops or peppers. I mean, everyone works, little mm -hmm. kids, really old people. So there's this sense of industriousness there. So, I mean, I saw t literally two beggars the entire time I was there. Now consider Afghanistan where people are like hitting you up every time, everywhere you turn, mm -hmm. literally two, and these people were Tuareg, you remember? Mm -hmm. So they weren't even Liberian, they were Tuareg refugees, and they were clearly little kids sure. who were being hustled. I, I don't want to let adults. the time, I'm sorry, excuse me, Teresa, I, but I don't want to let time expire, it's moving quickly, before we address this rape issue, which we've referenced, but haven't <coughs> s spoken about directly. And uh, before we began taping, we were talking about a piece that Teresa wrote, all complimenting her on a pretty powerful piece. And it, you. if you could set the scene for this discussion, and then we'll have Ed and Suni weigh in. Yeah, rape was very much a, it was, it's the remnant of, of the war. And whether or not, I mean, something like, estimates are anywhere from 60 to 90 percent of the women, um, Liberian women, children, girls. 60 babies, to 90 percent of the entire population. Female population. Including the president. Yes, I think she was attempted rape, though I might be wrong. Assaulted, that. sexually assaulted. No, she was, she thought she was going to, she, uh, Sam Doe had her locked up, and there were 14 men in the cell with her, and the guard happened to be one of her people, and... He saved her at the last Saved minute. her. The last, the other 14 were all executed, and he stayed in the cell with her that night to make sure she would not be attacked. Yeah, but I mean, babies you know one-year-old children are raped and um, and this is and people were during war rape was used as a tool to um, tear people apart to um, create tribally, havoc exactly tribally disrupt their their whole culture so fathers would be forced to rape their daughters in front of the rest of the family mothers would be forced to have sex with their sons um, you know one um, former um, uh, warlord uh, Mark Dowie that we met um, in uh, Nimba County, now a farmer, he talked about watching his mother be raped in front of him and his sister carried off and he never saw her again. Um, so, you know, how do you recover from something like that? And, I mean, yes, I mean, obviously the misogyny, the roots of misogyny had to be present there, you know, to let that kind of thing flourish during the war. But, I mean, it's very much scarred the country, um, but also you see this consciousness that we have to correct this. So there are like, you know, gender-based violence clinics all over. We visited a hospital, the Redemption Hospital in Monrovia, where they had a special clinic for gender-based violence. We visited um, a safe home for um, rape survivors, and it was really striking because when we went to visit it, it was outside of Monrovia in Painesville, like a suburb. Monrovia and there were all these children that were playing in the yard well, we found out those were their clients were the kids playing yeah 10, children nine the, eight yeah, yeah. yeah. it I mean, was a 13 year old girl had triplets yep how you know this might seem uh, how can a, a story like this remain underreported why well, doesn't the, uh, I, the I world think, turn its attention to these matters you know I think rape in the Congo actually became a very big story and it changed right. the laws of the nation. Right. And I think in Liberia what you have is um, from the top you have someone who's made it an important issue. Right. I interviewed the uh, the chief prosecutor for Monrovia, for the county, uh, was a very strong woman, uh, but um, I'm veering away a little, but there's there's like she's trying cases, but there's hardly a justice system, yeah. so 
how many people, you know, you get into issues the of... The desire for justice, but not the infrastructure to... And also, you also the completely. people, there's still a reluctance for people to prosecute. You take you away know? the breadwinner of the family yeah. and everybody lives together. There's still the stigma, and, and there's still the stigma that know, the survivor has. You're going to ruin my family, you're taking my brother, husband. But we, the, why we, it's underreported, I think, uh, I think, it, you know, rape in the Congo and, and uh, a few other countries became a big issue. And then there is this odd, um, odd mix of, uh, of, of, of how much do you portray the country in this way and, and how much do you get this important story out. Right. And, and look um, at other aspects of the progress. Yeah. And, and, and um, well, you know, we, we don't have time to do this justice. We are shockingly out of time, I, I can say that. But, but here's what I want to do for the benefit of our viewers and listeners before we end, is uh, you all of you have upcoming work that will be posted on websites and various places. I want you to each uh, tell us where we can find the stories that you're either currently, I, I know you're working on some videos that are being, Teresa, let's start with you. Where can people find your um, reporting you can from the library? Check out theroot.com, which is a Washington Post website dedicated to African American news and commentary, and you'll find my work on that site. Great. Ed? Um, all of our work's going to be on the International Reporting Project site, which is yes probably the major hub of Liberian stories And in that will America link to some of these other point. sources yes, as well. All of them. And yeah. it will link to all the other sources and my stories uh, will eventually be, um, because they're, they're not going to put them out and concentrate it on time.com, the Time Magazine mm -hmm. website. Sunny? Uh, uh, mine will be on the IRP website but also be on uh, WYPR's website, www.wypr.org. Yes, uh, four, five are there. Yeah. Uh, another one will be produced uh, today, which will run tomorrow, and then there'll be two online pieces that Ed and I sort of work together on. So they'll be there. Great. Also on the Wilson Center website, uh, later today, our three guests are going to take part in another panel here, a public event, and uh, that will be archived on the Wilson Center website as well. So I'm sorry we had to rush to the conclusion. There are many more things to talk about, uh, but we'll return next week with another edition of Dialogue. And until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, John. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Radio and Television. Our host Twitter feed is twitter.com slash John Malevsky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org.